I said, whether it's an online class or a face-to-face -face class, the key thing is what you call preparation. And when you prepare, you find that it's much easier to handle uh, challenging issues in the, in the class. Part of preparation, for example, will be you people wearing your regular suit with your tie and your trousers, complete with your shoes, sitting down on a chair with a table, paper, biro. Now you are ready for class. How many of you are doing that? I'm doing that, sir. Thank you. Because what it does is that it actually triggers your brain into understanding that it needs, that a challenge is coming and that it needs to prepare. So it prepares almost because you've created the scenario for its preparation. Now, if you are, for those of you lying down and covering yourself with blankets nowadays, uh, as we speak, what's going to happen to your brain is your brain is still going to be in that WhatsApp uh, mode where you just read things without really concentrating, without processing it. You know, when you are just flipping pages. So it's always better to be prepared in terms of making your brain understand that you are in beast mode for your lecture right now. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, yes, sir. Part of the things we are supposed to do today, obviously, we know what we, we followed our rules over these past weeks, and we know what the rules are. Basically, your, vid your videos and audios are muted. But if you need to talk, just unmute and talk. It doesn't. You don't need to. Uh, bother too much about raising your hands and doing all that. Because what we are hoping for is a very interactive class. And as far as uh, we, were supposed, we are supposed to treat sociological school today, and as far as I can tell you, and I'm not going to lie, the sociological school is slightly more challenging than a lot of the other schools that we have treated for two basic reasons. Number one, its level of abstractness is higher than some of the other schools. Number two is also the requirement that because it is sociological jurisprudence, it must attach to specific physical things. I hope we understand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, the reason and I think you'll find it really interesting, even though, again, like I said, it's likely to be a little challenging. But most of the things that we talked uh, about last three, uh, the past two, three weeks, will be brought to bear in this particular order. So because of the, we are going to treat roughly about five or so scholars for the sociological school. Then we'll also try to deal with the main premise upon which the sociological school of um, law came into being. But when we are doing that, it helps to constantly remember what we have said in terms of the natural law school when we're just talking about it in general terms because we've not treated that. The positivist school, the, and also the historical school. Now, one of the key things for the sociological school is that the sociological, sociological school's theories were mostly an offshoot of the historical school. They were, mostly members of the historical school, people like um, Arlich and uh, Rudolf von Aring were members of the historical school, the German historical school. And they found out that there were still some questions that needed to be answered. And some of them started trying to propound theories in terms of graduating from what you call a Volksgist or a national conscience to, uh, as um, Arlich called it, the living law of the people. Now, I'm going to put up my presentation so that we can stay true to the presentation and then we do a, we knock off the points, then we discuss as we are going through the going through the slides. I hope you have the slides now. Yes, sir. Yeah, why are you not sounding enthusiastic? 
du cold. Hello. Yes, I have the slide. Hi, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you? We are fine, sir. So I hope you are enthusiastic course. about the class. Yes, sir. Yeah, we are. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, okay. I believe you completely. <laughs> now, the people, the scholars we are going to be talking about will be August Comte, um, Reginald Daz, Rudolf Van Eering, um, Eugene Arlich, and Roscoe Pound. Those are the main, but again, for the sociological school, there are more scholars of the sociological school that you can uh, count. So what we're trying to do is focus on the ones that best exemplify the theories of the sociological school. Obviously, there are other scholars, such as um, Emil Durkheim, right? And uh, people like Max Weber that are from the sociological school that we are not going to treat, but they are, in fact, some of the founding fathers of the sociological school together with um, Jeremy Bentham, which we have treated. Now, the purpose of this is to understand what the sociological school is about, what is the main premise, the main theme upon which the school was formed, and then how some of the scholars, uh, the, the, the differences, the slight deviations in terms of what their own theories and their basic principles are. Now, we'll treat, there are five basic things that have become standard with the sociological school. The very first one is that the sociological school is focused on the working of the law. And they want to eschew some of the abstractness that have come to accompany theorizations and uh, understanding of the law. So the focus is always for them, how the law works. And then further, they look at law as a social institution among other social institutions. There are other institutions that mimic how the law functions. One is religion. Another one is analogical behavior by the society. Yet a third one could be said to be morality, where society also controls uh, what people, how people behave using moral standards. Now, law is one of these. And what the sociological scholars uh, focus on is that law is one social institution among other social institutions. Now, who can help us? Who finds this relatable to something another scholar has said in our previous classes? And then if you can explain that to me, that would be nice. Are you guys online? Class rep, are you people online? Yes, sir. Yes, we are, sir. I know what's happening. Somebody doesn't want to say we are online, then I'll tell you to answer that question. <laughs> okay, now when they talk about, the first thing that comes to your mind is, there was a scholar in the analytical or positivist school that said law was, a, that, that, that talked about the pure theory of law, which was a theme that went through the whole political, uh, the whole uh, positivist school to the effect that law should not be concerned with other fields. And you're having someone, a theme from the sociological school that says law is just one of the social institutions. Can you find the deviation now? Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Size of very clear, sir. Okay, let me go back to the basis of what you said earlier. You know, we talked about schools of jurisprudence and we mentioned that you could belong to several schools based on the theories that you are propounding. So a theory does not necessarily sit with just one school. When Jeremy Bentham said law is whatever the legislature enacts, that was a theme that ran through the positivist school. But when he also came out with his principle of utility that was focused on things like what is the uh, what are the interests in society and then how are those interests taken care of? And he came and we talked about the principle of pleasure and pain and all that. That aspect of his theorization moved him again to the sociological school. Because the sociological school became a school that was focused on interests and purposes. What is the, what are society's interests? What is the purpose of law? And that is the general uh, guide that was brought to us by the principle of utility, okay? Now, when you talk about the sociological school of jurisprudence and we, what we're doing just now was going through the themes and for each theme, for everything that they say, you understand clearly that, okay, this is in contradiction to so, so thing that we have done, right? Okay. Yes, yes, sir. Because if you can do that reasoning, then you are beginning to analyze. And that is when we start enjoying jurisprudence because your brain is telling you, no, this can't be, well, this is just one person's opinion. Somebody else said so, 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 and so. This is in contradiction to so, because the best way you can understand the schools of jurisprudence is when you start understanding the, the differences. And for each school, the reason there are newer schools of uh, jurisprudence after the old traditional ones is because of differences in reasoning and in analyzing law, how they define law, what they think law and legal education, for example, should focus on. Now, if somebody says the law is just one social institution among other social institutions, then it goes directly contrary to uh, Hans Kelsen's idea of the pure theory of law. And that is what one of the themes that runs through the sociological school. Another theme that runs through the soci sociological school is purpose. What purpose is the law supposed to serve? And in trying to understand what purpose the law, what, when we talk about purpose, one of the things you have to understand is the background of societies across Europe before the coming of the sociological school. In Europe, a lot of it medieval at the time, the state was only was mostly concerned with sanctions, the sanction, the command and sanction aspect of law, where the state basically said, this is what we want. If you do not do it, this is the repercussion in simple terms. And because of that, there was, there were a lot of misgivings among the society because the society felt a disconnection from the state, from government. And those led to revolutions across a lot of European countries. France obviously being uh, one of those um, countries. Now, these revolutions were some of the things because it, obviously stated, it obviously concerned sociological scholars because there was a disconnection between the society and law. And this galvanized more work into the understanding of law, but now with societal input. Because law is now seen, scholars started seeing law as an institution that should be at the vanguard of the progress of society. I hope we get it up to this point. No, sir. Sir, please come again. Hello. Hi. Sir, I do not understand this purpose. 
Part of the problem I think we have in this class and in any jurisprudence class anywhere, but in Nigeria more particularly is we don't prepare before the class. Mr. Emmanuel Uba, in all honesty, did you read about sociological school before coming to class today? No, sir. That's the point. You have to prepare. Because a, social, a, a class in jurisprudence is not like football where you just sit down, you watch it, and then you understand what's happening. There has to be some level of preparation before you come to class. If you don't have that level of preparation, if you don't read about sociological school, then it makes it very difficult for you to understand what is being taught. So we have to prepare, not just for jurisprudence, for every class you go for. Sometimes it's just one hour of reading about the topic that you're supposed to do before you get to class. I hope we understand. Yes, sir. But I'll do a little recap again. We've done the idea of law. We treated that. We have treated the positivist school. We have treated the historical school. During the treatment of all these um, three heads of our topics for this semester, we talked generally about the natural law school, about the whole idea of human reasoning and all that. Now, la the last time we saw, we treated the historical school. Now, if you treated the historical school, you will understand that there were certain things that we treated two scholars of the historical school, Calvin Savigny and Harry May, right? And we talked about Calvin Savigny's um, reaction to the call for codification in Germany, where he said that uh, codification after the Roman law was wrong and improper and will, ne will not be able to function in Germany because of what he called the national, the, uh, national consciousness, for uh, lack of a better phrase. But the word is Vogue's gist. Now, we said some of the scholars who were originally members of the sociological uh, of the historical school started understanding that there were some criticisms of the historical school and that certain things were missing in, were missing in terms of how the historical school propounded its theories. And you found people like um, Alich, Arin, who were originally of the German. Uh, historical school beginning to propound theories for sociological jurisprudence. And when they propounded the theories for sociological jurisprudence, we said we are going to be treating people like, uh, we, we, there are people like um, Durkheim and Max Weber and the others who are also, again, Jeremy Bentham, who are like fathers of the sociological school. But the main focus will be Comte who is seen as, in fact, he was the first person to have used the word sociology. And then we'll also talk about some of the things that Dyer said, Aaron, Alich, Pound. Now, for all those, we said there are certain themes that cut across everybody's theorization. Some of these themes are one, that they view the working of law as being more important than the form of law. How does the law work? And the working of the law is focused on society's interaction with the law. I'll give you an example. Most times you find the formal law, which is also, again, you now cast your mind back to Jeremy Bentham's uh, the importance he placed on legislation. Now, if he placed that much importance on legislation, then it means that the focus is on legislation and nothing uh, else. Now, the sociological school is saying, why you have that formal law, there's also some informal way of doing things that goes hand in hand with society's interaction with each other. I'll give you an example. Okay, let me leave the example and not confuse the issue. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that later. 
Now, and we said some of the main themes that run across these things are number one, that law is only one social institution among other social institutions. Two, that the focus was on how the law works, its interaction with society. Three, the purpose of law. What is the purpose? Because a lot of the other schools did not pay much attention to the idea that law should be the vanguard that drives society towards progress, which is what the sociological school is focused on doing. And for them to be able to do that, there are two things that are very important. Number one, interests. What is the interest of every member of society? What is the interest of the state? What is the interest of society of the of the individual in society? What is the interest of society? What is the interest of the of the state? And there's a general uh, consensus among scholars of the sociological school that all those interests can be brought harmoniously together and prioritized. And that if you get the right priority for each of those interests, then you'll be able to move the society towards progress. And that law should be an institution whose main purpose should be accomplishing the requirements of society. I hope you are, you are with me. Yes, sir. Don't you all say yes, yes sir. Are you with me? I am with you. Okay. Are with you. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Now, some of the things that we do for the social, I'll tell you about the importance of the sociological school, and that comes from sometimes very personal experience. I think as we go on and you can and you are able to attack the sociological school's impact to specific things, then you begin to understand the importance of this, of this particular um, school. So let's go, someone is writing on our slide. Can you please stop that? Now for Irene, for example, uh, sorry, uh, August Comte, we said was a French philosopher who basically gave an encompassing approach of the study of law and coined the phrase sociology. The sociological school carried, like I told you earlier, some tenets of the historical school because they were mostly scholars originally of the historical school who wanted to substitute the historical school idea was Vogue's gist that there should be a national consciousness. But what the sociological school did was to try to substitute what they called national consciousness for social justice. And that the state should be more focused on justice, on purpose, as against just brandishing uh, legislations and saying what is law and what is not, what is not law. Now, he said that there were, uh, the, but the contribution of various scholars came to the same thing, which, which are the tenants that we were discussing just now. And the first one was that law is not unique, but only one of the social control norms. Law is not unique, only one of the social control norms. Religion is not called law, but it controls society. Morality is not called law, but it controls society. Analogical behavior is not called law, but it controls society. And I'll tell you, so, some of the analogical behaviors could be something as basic as fashion, for example. This morning when I came out, I dressed because it was a Friday, and I put on my cap, which I rarely do. That is analogical behavior. I hope we are understanding. Yes, sir. And in a way, this is similar to law, but it is not law because it carries no sanctions if I decide to dress differently. And that social economic problems of the present time, of 
the time could not be solved by means of the existing laws. And I'll tell you why at that time, the social economic problems couldn't be solved. You had things like the depression. The depression was where most of the countries in Europe went bank bankrupt. And because of that, the state was weakened in terms of how it could handle the problems of society. And because the state was weakened, the law had more or less had to be called upon to set the stage for a revival of society. And that is where the sociological uh, scholars came in, in terms of propounding theories as to how to make law the vanguard for the emergence of society from that slum. Now, another thing they said was that law in the statute books, of course, things like legislation, exposition of judges and all that in a law reports and all that, well, was different from the actual law practiced by society in terms of their relationship with each other. Now, if this relationship is different, let me give you an example that I wanted to give before at this juncture. When you look at the Igbo apprenticeship system, was it written in any legislation? When I mean Igbo yes, apprenticeship yes, system is where somebody is a commercial person, he is buying and selling, he has two other apprentices working under him. When he finally thinks that they are good enough to be free, he frees them, but he doesn't just free them, he settles them. How does he settle them? He settles them with funds for them to start their own uh, businesses of similar type. He doesn't just settle them with funds, he has given them knowledge and then he gives them some of his own network for trading. If trading is what they are doing. How many people have seen this in work? We have seen it, sir. I am. Now, it's great that you've seen it because that is perhaps one of the greatest anywhere in the world, one of the greatest modes by which there is, by which people move out of poverty. Where you have a transmission of knowledge, funds and networking for, business purposes and you find that uh there's an increment in in wealth from people who had absolutely no hope of being they become big businessmen and all that and this particular way of transacting business and transmitting from poverty to wealth is unique anywhere in the world but did any legislation bring this about? No, sir. No. It was a living practice going side by side with legislation, legislation on its own, and then this living practice on its own. And there were basic sanctions in terms of if somebody has worked for you for what, 10 years or something, and you free him, and you refuse to give him funding to start his own business. One of the greatest sanctions in the old days was excommunication. People just start dealing with you and look at you as someone who is not trustworthy. And because of that, you will lose all, if nothing else, you will lose your financial standing in society and social standing. And that is as worse a punishment as most people can bear. Now, when we look at things like this, one of the things that comes to, to your mind is, could the law even have instituted this? Do you think a law could have instituted this for this to be followed in this manner? A legislation, for example. Yes, no. And there is now this goes to the crux of the sociological schools thinking which is that there are things that work side by side with the law. Comte calls, he uses two words. The first one he calls it social statics and the second one he calls it um, dynamics. This is, social statics is basically when you are talking about um, things that are more or less decisions, what is happening in society's relationship with the law 
and then society's relationship with itself in terms of how dynamic society can be to resolve issues without reference to legislation or to the state. Now, the fourth one is that law is not an absolute and static body of rules in themselves, but are relative to time, place, and society. Can someone please tell me what does this, this is an affront to, to what now? It's a contradiction to what that we discussed before. Positive school. Well, not positive school. We've discussed generally the natural law school, right? Uh. And we said the natural uh. law school was trying to universalize law by saying that every human being is imbued with natural reason and logic that made him behave in a specific manner. And because of that, they will react to laws, whether and that almost like law was universal, whether it was in America or Nigeria or whatever, that there were specific human reasoning that made us obey certain laws and make us uh, generate certain laws. And these people are in direct contradiction to that. The sociologists now are saying that whatever laws there are, it's not, it cannot be a static body of rules, that it is relative to time, place, and society. I hope we are getting that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK. Now, can someone give me an example of some, something that's not, that you think some law that is not, is not relative to time, place, and society? Sorry, that is relative to time, place, and society. Law and technology. Law and technology. Um, laws of LGBTQ. LGBTQ, right? Cybercrime yes, laws. Fantastic. Now, all these things you are saying came to my mind, but the LGBTQ, the LGBT uh, issue was the foremost thing in my mind. Because, for example, the Supreme Court in the US has allowed same-sex marriage because it is reasonable. Why? You are talking about consenting adults. In Nigeria and a lot of African countries, you have six, six, same, the same same-sex marriage prohibitions, right? Yes, sir. Because yes. of what? It is unreasonable. So you can have that contradiction. Because you look back into our societies and also think in terms of the killing of, uh, if there are twins, for example, the killing of twins, the dumping of uh, albinos into evil forest and all that, uh, those uh, traditional things that we've come to learn about. And you find out that what they are saying is that law is relative to time, place, and society. It is specific. And this doesn't contradict what the historical school says in a way, because again, what the historical says is it is specific to a people's will. But it contradicts what the natural law school is saying, because what the natural law school is focused on is a kind of universal reason that every human being has, which in a few sentences we have shown uh, is not true. Now, they also say that there is such thing as social justice, and we'll come to that later. Social justice means that there is a way by which the several interests in society can be harmoniously taken care of, putting priorities based on that particular society's needs, and that that will further advance the, the society. Roscoe Pound, talks about three basic interests. He talks about the first interest being, the uh, one interest being the individual's interest, another one being society's interest, and the third one being uh, 
public interest. When he means public interest, I know you can have a confusion between public and society. Public interest is basically uh, interest that is relatable uh, to the state or government as the case may be. Society's interest will be communal interest among the society. And then obviously you have what you call the individual interest. When you have all those three interests, which interest should be prioritized will depend on the dynamics of every society. I'll give you an example. Around my law firm, there are some of these apartments that were given to people for residential purposes. And one person close to my law firm just um, turned his own apartment into a beer parlor. And in the night, they will play music. Obviously, I come to my office in the morning and leave before that time. So for about a week, I was unaware until someone told me that this is a lawyer. This is what is happening here. This is what we, the neighbors, are going through. And I looked at it from a sociological perspective, which is this is one individual. If miscreants are coming here to drink beer and people are afraid of uh, theft and burglaries and all that, and then he's using music to disturb people in the night. Obviously, this is society's interest against that individual's interest. Which interest do you think should take priority? Society. society. In this particular instance, society's interest will take, and I went to them and I told them, there are two ways. Number one, you either dismantle your beer uh, parlor and stop disturbing everybody here, or you pack out of the place and go. And I became something of a hero for two days for entrenching society's interest because the beer parlor was uh, dismantled. Now people can sleep without any disturbance. And basically that is how the sociological school views the law, that there are certain interests in society and each society must determine which interest is worthy of recognition and after recognition is worthy of advancing. I hope we are getting it as we go. Yes, sir. Now, yes, sir. The, some of the uh, things we are going to do may sound a little technical until we start attaching them to, to specific things. Now, Comte also stated that the advancement of knowledge could be through only observation and experiment. And the reason is simple. Now, in the old days, in the uh, sciences and social sciences, there was a way scholars of those persuasion looked at law as something that was not methodical, was not scientific in nature. Why? Because of the workings of, again, other schools of law that are thought of law as highly discretionary in terms of what we think, in terms of decisions that emanate from, from law, where you, a particular judge will read a section of a statute, interpret it in one way. Another judge will read the section of another statute and interpret it in a completely different way. As a matter of fact, the same judge can look at it in another case and yet interpret it in a third way. So because of that, law suffered in the academia from what you call having something that was predictable. And the sociological school uh, wanted to show that law and the methods of reaching decisions could also be a science. And like all sciences, there will be observation and experiment. You know, I used to crack these jokes with your class, and I'm sure I did that in the first semester before COVID came in, when we were talking about uh, certain things. And I said, some of the ways you can observe people in social experiments will be, if all of you now, you have three months to go before law school, and then suddenly they say there's a war somewhere or something, and that they have closed all universities. Some of you laughed at the time.
Hello. Yes, sir. Because you yeah, laugh because it appeared impossible. Well, there was no, and we talked about human behavior. If there's a war, for example, and they close down school, and some that were thinking of calling masquerades to come and dance for them on graduation day, suddenly realize that there will be no graduation day. How will you behave? What will be your reaction? There was no war, but there was COVID. And exactly the same thing happened, which was, Ideally, all of you should be at the law school now. You are not at the law school, right? Yes, sir. So we observe that behavior and we experiment based on that uh, behavior, much in the way the social sciences and the sciences behave when they are experimenting things. And for you to do that, sometimes you have to go into the society to be part of the society to carry out what they call uh targeted researches and all that and the focus of the sociological school was number one how do you look at law and it says you can look at law in a scientific manner through observation and experiment i hope we are getting it. Yes, Emmanuel, I see that you are the first person whose uh, microphone was unmuted. Any problem? No. You are good so far? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, we said he compartmentalized sociology into to basically social statics and social dynamics, all coming out from the description of sociology as the science of social order and progress. Before, the focus on law was just social order. There wasn't a linkage to progress as a purpose of law. Because law didn't see itself as a social content that advanced progress. It basically felt like it was his duty to leave that to the politicians and the legislatures. I hope we, we are getting that. Yes, sir. But why sociology became important was because of the laissez-faire notion of law and state, that law should be disconnected from society's happenings. And I'll tell you why this is so important. If law could be disconnected from society's happenings, then how does law affect the lives of people? Some of the things we we'll probably talk about later, we may not, if for example, if law is disconnected from me and somebody kills someone that's a member of my family, what it means is that the prosecutor can do a plea deal with that person, a prosecutor can sit down in his office and say, look, we are not going to be able to catch him for, I don't think we have enough evidence for murder. Let us try him for manslaughter. If he will admit guilt without taking us through the whole process of a court trial, what used to happen is the prosecutor just go ahead and enter that deal without any contact with the families of the, of the victim. Now, because of the work of sociological scholars, that is not happening across most of Europe anymore. They discuss the families of the victim become members. They become part of that discussion. The families of the victim can say, we insist he, be he should be tried for murder. If there's no conviction, there's no conviction. We don't mind. So because of that, you find that everybody's interest is recognized. And what remains is to prioritize those interests. Then we said the law is expected not only to maintain law and order and throwing the interest of individuals, like we said, the focus shouldn't be on individual, the focus should be on society itself. And it, the law also formulates objects and purposes. In our previous class, you saw me talk about 
how can you be in a developing country and you are not thinking of interpreting law in line with development? How does this law help us develop? If I interpret it this way, does it assist development or does it regress? Does it take us back? And then we said that these are the objectives the law must be used to achieve. That is the thinking of the sociologists. There must be harmony, a harmonious interaction with society and the law. And then those interests, the interests must be harnessed for the advancement of society. I hope we are okay so far. Yes, sir. We can ask any questions. I, I, the reason I'm probably faster today is because we have um, some scholars to go through. Now, we said Diaz also was one of the scholars of the sociological school. And he believed that sociology, again, like the others, like science, proceeds from observation to hypothesis and deductions are checked against the background of reality. We've done that just now, so I don't think we need to do much from it. That sociology is theoretical, and its main aim is synthesizing other disciplines such as politics, economics, and law. Now, what that basically means is we have someone who talked about the pure theory of law. We have people who talked about what you should focus on is what the law is and not what the law ought to be. You have other people that were talking about law being immune from society. And that is focusing on the synthesis between other disciplines and law. And I'll tell you why that synthesis is so important. One of the ways the synthesis is important is when someone comes to court, for example, and they talk about insanity as a defense. How do you synthesize to come out with a just decision? I need an answer. Synthesize something like psychology to be able to determine the mental state of a person. Fantastic. You synthesize psychology, you synthesize psychiatry, you synthesize medicine to understand whether this, obviously, uh, medical insanity or psychological or psychiatrical insanity is different from legal insanity. We understand that. But there is a reason why it is different. And part of the reason why it is different is because of the isolation of law from other fields in the first place. Because the way the law sees the McNaughton rule basically looks at insanity as, did this man know what he was doing when he did it? Did he know about the right or wrong of what he was doing when he did it? And there are some evidence that can show whether you understand that there was right or wrong. You could have done it and you run away. If you kill someone and you are running away, obviously you know that it is wrong. That's why you are running. If there's any act of subterfuge, that is to hide, you know it's wrong. So the kind of insanity that the law foresees is the kind of out and out crazy insanity where somebody is tearing his clothes and doesn't care. But there are other types of insanity that are out there that do not qualify as legal insanity. But we will not have an understanding of this unless there's that synthesis between those other disciplines and an understanding of those disciplines. Again, for administrative reasons, there are things we, we talked about. The, uh, I, I'm sure I've used the polygraph test somewhere as an example. For example, in the US, for example, the polygraph test is used to exclude people and it helps administration in the police um, stations. 
Why? Because we suspect that three people did something. One of them says, look, just strap me onto a polygraph. I'll do a polygraph test and I didn't do it. Did he do it? No, the polygraph administrator says, no, he's telling the truth. They exclude him. The police can focus on the other two people. But of course, there are people, there's a tiny percentage of maybe less than 1% of people that are probably able to beat a polygraph test and be lying through their teeth. And the polygraph test will say he's telling the truth. Why? Because we are all wired in different ways, right? But all this is what you call synthesis, synthesizing other disciplines. It's like economics and law, for example. How do you synthesize economics and law? One of the things we discussed there was, uh, one of the things we are discussing as a country before the administration of criminal justice act was plea bargaining. And a lot of people were talking about, well, if somebody, is, if somebody steals uh, 10 billion and decides to return 10 billion, you can plea bargain, you can do this, you can do that. That isn't, in the US, that isn't the principle or the concept behind plea bargaining. Plea bargaining is when 10 people commit a crime and there are one or two of them and they can't convict the 10 people because of a lack of evidence. But if one or two of them can confess to the crime, then that is, those are whistleblower laws. It makes everything easy. And why is the US legal system looking for that ease? They are looking for that ease because everybody, a lot of them are paid by the hour. The lawyer is paid by the hour. The judges are paid by the hour. The clerk in the courtroom may be paid by the hour, all that. So because of that, you link economics to law. Do we really want to, why don't we plea bargain with this person? Instead of uh, 20 years in jail, he collects five years in jail and a conviction, and then he pleads guilty. And the state saves maybe $1 million for trial. Those are the reasons why things like plea bargaining can make sense to a state. In Nigeria, for example, everybody, you have the civil servant, the judge is like a civil servant, the uh, people working on that clerk, everybody's a civil servant. Here, lawyers do not charge by the hour. So plea bargaining can only be brought under a different premise if there is one. But the key thing is now you are linking what is happening, plea bargaining with economics and law. There's that synthesis. I hope we are getting some of this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then we say it progresses cumulatively over a period of refinement and growth, and that it is non-ethical. So for someone who wants to be a scholar in sociology to study law, he has to be non-ethical. Non-ethical means if you want to study, whether you are a mullah or a pastor, you put that in your pocket while you are studying law. Why? Because it has to be non-ethical. Anything that will make you start with a default position will not be very helpful in terms of how you uh, define law and then isolate what you think are legal elements in the society. And for you to have an understanding of the interaction between law and society. And that sociological jurisprudence seeks to describe, explain, and predict. Describe. What is happening now? You are in a class. Explain. You have two months or one month to graduation. Predict. If someone says there's no graduation, what happens? You may get some people who will still go out there to their village people and be practicing as lawyers. You, are, you have people who will come out and say, look, I'm just tired of the world and all that stuff. That is prediction. The fact that you can um, describe what is happening, explain it, and then be able to predict what is going to happen in the, in the future. 
Now, and he says, law that is derived from a sociological investigation of society will be extracted from, for you to get at the law, you must sociologically investigate society. For you to investigate society, the information you gather must be extracted from certain things. Number one, A, is social morphology, the form of social structures. What is the form of social structure in Nigeria? Can somebody just tell us that? The form of social structure. Okay, let me give you, I hope you are with me first of all, before I explain. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. yes sir. Yeah. Now, the form of social, when we talk about the form of social structures, you look at Nigeria as a country and we have a hierarchical structure, mostly for everything. Number one, I'm the head of my house. My wife is second in command. My children are, of course, on the lower rung of the ladder, depending on their ages. That is a social structure. I'm a lecturer. The vice chancellor is above me. The deputy vice chancellors, I have my dean, I have my HOD, they are all above me. Then I am I'm here. And unfortunately, the students are at the bottom of the ladder. I say that just to wind some of you up this morning. Now, that's another social ladder. You work in the ministry, you have the director, you have the this and you have the that. Those are social ladder. Then there's a general social ladder. For example, when you talk about, you go to the mosque or church, there's a social ladder. The imam is imam, uh, and then you have daddy geo, and then mommy geo, and you have another set of social. So all these are things that you look at in terms of how law, uh, how you investigate law within societies. Why? That is what you call social morphology, social structures. Now, again, social change. I'm sure some of you did not know that the law and social change are in the subset of jurisprudence and a subset of the sociological school. Now you know. Because the focus is on how society changes. I talked about a sense of morality that I had when I was growing up as a child. When I say it to my children, they don't understand what the hell I'm talking about. When I joke to my children that my generation will be the first generation that listens to his parents and listen to his children at the same time, they don't understand what that means. Why? Because society is evolving. Previously, there was a we society where the coming together in villages and whatever made uh, the community strong. Now the individual is stronger, is becoming stronger than the communities. That is social change. These things are important in trying to understand law from a society, in trying to carry out an investigation, a sociological investigation in how law changes. Now, you also look at the society sometimes and you think, okay, the evolution, how has society evolved? And a lot of it may be tied down to things like economics, things like politics, things like uh, morality and other, other things. But what Diaz is saying is it's important if you want to understand law from the perspective of, of um, society. When we talked about the Igbo apprenticeship system, I'm sure it evolved 
not because it evolved out of a need. It wasn't as if someone just started and said, okay, let's do an apprenticeship system. It evolved out of a need to move more people out of poverty into wealth by giving them what? Knowledge that they require, funds that they require, and then network for doing businesses that they require. Now, the third one, he says, social pathology involving social disturbances and maladjustments. And that this is also important in trying to understand what the law is, because what we are trying to find is what you call the living law of the society. And these are the things that you have to look for when you are looking for the living law of the society that is working side by side with state law, which is mostly typified by legislation. And what this means, it talks about social uh, pathology. Social pathology talks, is talking about traumatic experiences in society. Can anybody name what you can call a traumatic experience in the Nigerian society? SARS, Police brutality. Full on men. Police brutality, full on men. Yes, go on. Kidnapping. Cybercrime. Cyber banditry. Yes. Cybercrime. Cybercrime, yes. Sexual assault. Sexual assault. Is it increasing? A quiet president. <laughs> Domestic violence. Hunger. <laughs> okay, hunger. Okay. Poverty. When you talk about when you talk about traumatic experiences, let me give you some examples of traumatic experiences. These are still good examples, other than the quiet president part. But let me give you examples of traumatic experiences. A traumatic experience in Nigeria will be the civil war. Because what happened was the war decimated the psychology of Nigerians and especially the Eastern, people from the Eastern extract so much that there was fear of people coming together to live together like they did. There was suspicion. And because that suspicion was not addressed, it carries on up to today. Then again, another thing could be, you know, we were in a country where uh, I remember when my elder brother went to the US, the dollar was actually, it was actually 65 cobalt to the dollar. 65 cobalt to the dollar. Then we had issues later with what people called the overvaluation of the, of the Naira and all that. And everything came tumbling down. Suddenly the economy changed. IMF was talking to Nigeria about the structural adjustment program. A structural adjustment program came in where obviously we couldn't travel the way we wanted to. We were not going out. We couldn't go abroad to buy things at the value we were. Our money, the value of the Nigerian Naira dropped suddenly and it killed many industrialists. It brought the economy into a tailspin. And basically, this same thing could uh, uh, more or less happen in England because you also had the depression. After the Industrial Revolution, there was a depression. And what caused the depression was people were moving towards services rather than products. You look at some of the most successful countries in Africa now, they are countries that are involved in services, not products. Countries that do not have any oil. Countries that don't have any cocoa to sell to anybody, but are focused on services such as digital services, educational services, all other kinds of services. Which is why Microsoft survived and companies like IBM had to uh, regenerate a new personality. 
Now, when we talk of pathology, you also talk about things such as not just the monetary financial things. We've talked about the civil war. There are other things that can bring trauma to a society. Now, when that trauma happens, how do people behave? Do they generate norms of conduct in terms of their interaction with each other? I hope we understand. Yes, sir. Now, again, social control was also important. Social control of not just law, but of things like morality, religion, fashion, and so on. We talked about if I'm entering a mosque on a Friday, especially if you're in the northern part of Nigeria, you are expected to wear a cap and do all that. Now, if you're entering a church anywhere, you are probably supposed to remove your cap. That exactly, leads sir. religion to fashion in terms of behavior, but it's also an analogical behavior of what people are do and then what rules are. And these rules are not stated in legislation. They live side by side with the rules that are stated in the, in the legislation. Then again, group behavior, which deals with the interaction between individuals, uh, individuals and groups and between groups. How do lecturers behave when they are together as a group? How do students behave when they are together as a group? It's important because before you evolve rules to govern them, all those considerations, that kind of investigation must be uh, must be done. Now, another, and those were the basic uh, tenets of uh, Daz's uh, proposition in terms of how do you find what you call the living law within societies? Because what the sociological scholars wanted was not that legislation would just come out of nowhere and try to control social behavior, but that there will be an investigation into what social behavior is and then legislation will advance it. I hope we are getting it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we find out that also there is a linkage somehow again with the precursor of their own school, the historical school, because what they were focused on was what was the customary law and all that stuff. But what we're talking about can be what we call living law may not necessarily be customary law, but it can encase customary law as well. So it's not a complete divergence in terms of what uh, the historical school uh, propounded and what the sociological school is propounding now. Now, Rudolf von Ehring was also somebody who was a, uh, a historical scholar, but they came in and talked about, he, he wrote a book called The Spirit of Roman Law. And then as he moved into, as he shifted more towards a scholar of sociological persuasion rather than a historical persuasion, he, after writing several, he, he left some of the volumes unfinished and wrote another one called Zadvak something. I'm sure if I speak German, yeah, I'm going to mispronounce it famously. But the English appellation is purpose in law. Why? Because we said the sociological school became more focused on what is the purpose of law? How do we advance society? And he said the basis of a right is an interest. You must have, when you look at the local standard rule, it basically tells you what, if you are talking about a right, what you do in court obviously is to prove that you have an interest, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And if you have an interest, it means that you have a standing in law to claim based on 
that interest. And what he is saying is the basis of a right is an interest. Now, how do you define what interest is and how do you prioritize? All those are discussions. But again, people criticize that even though he talked about the basis of an interest being right, a general, uh, a general criticism that runs across most of the scholars because of their focus on interests is that there isn't a scale of values to state categorically how to measure those interests. And for people that are talking about the scientific method, you expect that there will be a scale of values to measure interest. But people say that Irene's genius was probably in the origin of laws rather than in its application in terms of where law comes from. It's the same way when you think, in, when you think about Jeremy Bentham, where he talks about the origin of law in his principle of uh, utility, pleasure, and pain. What are we trying to achieve? What are you trying to move away from? Those basically form the foundations for, for law. Now, Alich was yet another scholar. And what he did, Eugene Alich, basically focused on what he said was the living law of society. He said that there were two things. Number one, there was norms of decision. And there was also something called norms of conduct. Now, norms of decision are basically laws that are like state laws. where there are decisions that have been passed down to the people. And he says, the people likely ignore norms of decision and focus on norms of conduct, which is the general rules and standards of behavior that they uh, come upon by interacting with each other. And that, norms of conduct should be what the state should be focusing on in terms of how laws should be generated. But part of the problem again with norms of conduct is the state's machine moves slowly. So while it is trying to legislate on what it considers to be norms of uh, conduct, norms of conduct can easily move ahead, leaving that legislation that tried to capture norms of conduct in its trail. I hope we are together. Yes, yes sir. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, now we could go deeper into each of these um, scholars. So what we are doing is just giving us a basic working material to work with. And like I told you, you can't, it's difficult to do jurisprudence and just come and swallow what your lecturer says. Number one, there's too much information out there to depend on your lecturer alone. Two, the lecturer can be wrong. Three, you are better than that. I hope we understand. Yes, sir. So, and he says that there are social facts and that the basis of all laws are as such, are all laws, social facts are the basis of all law. And because of that, what he calls the living law precedes formal law. And he says, the social facts which bring law into existence are usually in the form of usages, ownership, possession, and so on. The formal law arrives to recognize and give effect to the obligations and duties created by these social facts. We talked about landlord and tenant 
uh, laws. We talk about the payment of 10%, um, for example, for different kinds of job, jobs, maybe 15% for valuations, this, this, and that. And all those emanate, if you look at common law as something closely related to what you call the living law of the English at the time, then all those kinds of behavior can be seen as what were norms of conduct. And later there was validation of those norms of conduct by norms of decision by the state. But it doesn't mean that it stays the same. As that is happening, there is even further evolution. So the former law arrives to recognize and give effect to the obligations that have been uh, to the obligations that have been created by these social facts of intermingling and inter uh, relationships. And he said, the living law must be sought from outside the available legal materials, such as uh, legislation, court judgments, and all that. You must go into the society to find these um, living laws. And he said, laws can be found, the living law can be found through judicial decisions, first through judicial decisions, but that these judicial decisions are only evidentiary. It may not be factual. It may just be evidentiary of a state of affairs. And two, modern business documents, which are judicial, which judicial decisions needed to check. And when we talk about modern uh, documents, there was a time here, I was, you know, most of the clauses in your land agreements, especially if you are buying a native land, is if there, one of the clauses will state if there's any problem, blah, blah, blah. A scammer can scam you, sell you land that is not his own, you buy, then the agreement says that because there is no specific clause there, what you are entitled to, if you go to court, will be what you have paid this person. So if you go to court, say in 10 years time, it could be 10,000 naira you have paid for that plot of land. What you are entitled to is 10,000 naira. At the very best, the court can give you an additional 10% or something for as interest on it. And we came upon this and we said, obviously this is wrong, it can't be right. And we started, I started doing agreements that said basically that anytime a third party right comes up and claims ownership of that place, of uh, the, the plot of land, the original person that sold to you will refund you the current market value. Now, as I stand today, I do not even know whether that is legal or not. Because if you are talking about an agreement that was illegal in the first place, can you build anything on it? But obviously that is an argument for another discussion. Now, if you look at these kinds of documents, the question now is, is this what the living law is supposed to be among the people? Is this what they will better appreciate than what legislation in terms of what it considers uh, legal and illegal is focused on? So you look at modern business documents and uh, the last one is observation of people. And you get the observation of people by living among them. And the focus is always advancement, progress of the society. Now, some of his criticisms are stated here. And one of them is that his contempt for formal laws appeared too judgmental. And the reason is this that there are reasons why, for example, formal laws can be very important and can be the drivers of society. I can tell you, for example, that 
if let's look at the telecommunications industry when telecommunications came in the only thing people were focused on the only thing we could do with telephones at the time was just to make telephone calls when and then later the gsm came in and we could make telephone calls but only this time around we could make i think that was in the 80s we could make telephone calls by moving around you didn't have to come to your house before you could make a telephone call and suddenly there was a change some people there was an innovation of being able to send text messages which wasn't there before then after sending text messages there was now sms where you could take a picture and send pictures down to what we now have where you are sending a full-fledged uh, movie or something to whoever you can send games you can do practically anything your telephone is now like a miniature uh full-fledged computer in your hands now if you were waiting for the living law could you have made could the living law have stopped people from sending say obscene images Yes or no? If the living law could have stopped people from sending up sin messages, it would have done that long after the fact. But legislation could have done it before people even had the capability to do it. Which is why some people say his content for formal laws appears uh, judgmental. And two, he did not endow formal law with any creative qualities and considered it non-functional. Three, his distinction between norms of decision and norms of, be of behavior were seen as belated, even at the time he propounded it, because already there were inklings of these already in the historical school at the time. And then, while it was fruitful to study law against society's happenings, the mode by which this study was to be conducted according to Ali would have erased the significance of formal laws completely. Because if you are talking about going and then living with the people and then finding out what they want and then now using the law to validate what they were already doing, then the function of legislation will be greatly reduced i hope we are still together so far yes sir, yes, sir. i told you this was yes, going to be challenging but like we said you know when we talked i think about two weeks ago we were talking about the book called the outlier and we talked about another one called mindset right mindset. now yes, sir. if you're an athlete the first lesson you learn as an athlete is that if your muscles are not aching, your muscles are not growing. It's the same way with your brain. If your brain is not challenged, it is not expanding in knowledge. So for periods like this, that is when you go back and you ask yourself, are you seeing problems or are you seeing solutions? Because if you are seeing problems, then it can create a mental block for you. If you are looking at solutions, rather than, am I failing or am I passing? If you are looking for solutions, then you enjoy, I don't drink wine, but I'm assuming jurisprudence is one of those things that you acquire a taste for as you indulge in it more. Which is probably the same thing I think happens with uh, wine. And unfortunately, maybe even cigarettes. Now, we come to Roscoe Pound. And Roscoe Pound's idea, you know, we already said that there was a way he uh, fragmented interests. And he said there was something called an uh, individual interest, public interest, and society's interest. And he said you could engineer those interests in terms of priority. 
And that was probably the first time the phrase social engineering, which every politician uh, says now, came into being. Social engineering, that a judge must look at a matter, understand the interests, and then make a decision in terms of, he, he catalogs the interest and in, has an inventory, then makes a decision as to how those interests can be best taken care of, which priority, which interest is of a greater priority than another uh, interest. And we said, what he said basically in terms, particularly in respect of judges, was that the judicial, the jurists must have an inventory or catalog of the interest of the individual the public and the society. And secondly, that the jurists must select and recognize those interests as worthy of protection. And thirdly, the jurists must determine the limits within, uh, within which those recognized interests can be realized. F that the jurists must select the means for realizing and giving effect to those recognized interests within the limits so determined. I hope we are getting it. Yes, sir. I think that is uh, basic enough for us. So let's move to the next slide. Now, what he does is that he defines an interest as a demand desire or expectation which human beings either individually or as a group seek to achieve and he classifies these interests into three one individual interest two public interest and social interest individual interest are those ones that are focused on the person as an individual, such as privacy, the right to human dignity, right to liberty, right to own property, and so on and so forth. And public interest is that that you relate to the, uh, from the standpoint of a state. For example, peaceful coexistence, maybe development. And when we talk about development, when we uh, interest, we, I keep using to you, for example, if you look at what is the interest, if let's assume a company dumps um, chemicals inside drinking water or a stream, you look at three interests now. The interest of the company, which can be looked at from the perspective of being an individual. The interest of society, which is interested in having potable water. Then you look at the interest of government, which may be interested in employment creation and taxation of that same company. All these are interests that come into play and that these interests must be harnessed according to Roscoe Pound in judicial decisions. And that the way to do this is through social engineering by putting those interests and then being able to itemize each person's interests, what he seeks to achieve, and then making a decision based on that. And we said some of the criticisms is that the analogy of engineering that he used did not capture these things because while we are trying to look at it from a scientific, uh, we, we try, while the sociologists were trying to look at law from a scientific perspective, the weight and value of those interests cannot be specific. 
And two, he assumed that those interests were there to be recognized and to protect. And people say sometimes interests are created for the first time by the decisions of judges. And that it cannot be the uh, interest, how interests are determined cannot be done in a mathematical manner. And that balancing interests is not the same thing as balancing two objects. So that goes for the scholars that we are going to treat under the sociological school. But when we talk about impact, I think you will be more interested in impact of the sociological school and you'll be able to transmit that impact into what the scholars were saying. Any questions so far? Okay, now when we talk about the impact of a particular school, we talked about positivist school and how they made us understand legislation more than we did before. You know, we are still talking about that mirror that we are using to look at different images. We are talking about use. And then generally, because we've not treated the natural law school, we spoke about the natural law school, so what, where you have social, the uh, Hugo Grotius and social contract theory, where the people give some of their freedoms in allegiance to a state and the state protects them in a social contract uh, transaction and then protects things like their right to life, their right to liberty, right to property, uh, fundamental and other human rights, ETC. Now, the work of the natural law school is basically what, the basis of it is what is encompassed in your chapter two and chapter four of the constitution, because it forms the basis upon which the governed and the governed and the governor exist. Now, the impact of the sociological, the impact of sociological jurisprudence will also be addressed. One of the ways that sociological jurisprudence has impacted law is the way in which evidence is introduced in court. Now this used to be, I think, section eight. Now it's section five. And it says facts which are the occasion, cause or effect immediate or otherwise of relevant facts or facts in issue, or which constitute the state of things under which they happen, or which afforded an opportunity for their occurrence or transaction are relevant. Now, if I kill someone, God forbid, will how I was brought up as a child be relevant? Not necessarily. Yes, sir. It, it will be relevant. Yes, sir. Who thinks it, it will be relevant? Maybe we start with you. The not necessarily man. Can you answer us? Okay, who thinks it will be relevant? And why? I do, sir. Okay, Abdurraza, Abdurraza, Karim, go on. All right, so I think the fact of how you were brought up is relevant because sometimes if we discover that the background of that kind of child is somewhat violent or... Wait, can you move closer child. to your uh, laptop? I can hardly hear you. I think the fact of how the person was brought up is irrelevant because if that person is being brought up in society which actually sees if you freaking injured on someone as something normal and is not actually a literary legal implication because people have been doing it in this presence and they have been going away with it. So we think it's actually normal. So looking at the history of that particular that we have impact on that case. Okay, okay. Who else? Mr. Ku. Yeah. Okay, sir. 
Um, I, I think it will be relevant. Why? Because, for instance, a child who grew up seeing his dad always beating the mom, his psychological reasoning will be affected. And possibly when he gets married, too, he would see nothing wrong in maltreating women or beating his wife because that's what he has always, that's what he grew up with, seeing a man always oppressing and beating a woman. Thank you. There's someone else that was raising the hand with you at the same time. Okay, let's take those two. Our law says it is relevant. Now, wh whether judges accept that it is relevant or not is a different thing entirely. But what section five says is that facts which are the occasion, cause, or effect. If I'm violent because of a violent childhood, that should be relevant. And increasingly in other jurisdictions, the jurisprudential merit of that in Nigeria is under question. But increasingly in other jurisdictions, in the US, in other countries, you are finding information like that being brought in court. Obviously, the judge has to make a decision as to whether that information is important for overturning a, a decision or not, or arriving at a decision. But the fact is, it is still evidence that can be adduced in court. And these are the work of sociological scholars. Because what it means is that law is beginning to synthesize with other disciplines. A psychologist can come in and talk about the person who's a parent. And you look at an act, there's a philosophy behind it. When a child sees a man beat his mother, what occurs to him is the way you exercise power and control is by physical domination, physical domination of a woman. He grows with that. In future, he finds out that sitting down to reason with a woman is difficult for him because he has an implanted philosophy that tells him that, why am I reasoning with this person? I can just beat compliance out of you. So evidence like that can be important. Increasingly in US courts, so obviously people are fabricating all kinds of evidence of um, childhood molestation, childhood violence and all that to get out of um, whatever, to get out of um, convictions. But the truth of the matter is that the law says that kind of evidence can be adduced. And these are the work of, uh, like we said, sociological scholars. Then inquiry relating to permissiveness in obedience. In the old days, laws were just made. If you follow the positivist school and all that, Nobody was focused in terms of whether those laws were obeyed or not. There was an evolution of the positivist school's idea of whether law is obeyed or is not obeyed, blah, blah, blah. Now, the way they ev evolved it was for people like HLA Hart and uh, Raz to say it was being addressed to officers and not to people. But from a sociological perspective, it doesn't matter who it was being addressed to. Because you can also address those laws to office, uh, government officials and not people. And government officials will not adhere to them. So for the first time there was, I mean, for the first time sociological input is bringing an inquiry into the obedience in laws, whether laws could be obeyed whether they could not be obeyed. And th th there were reasons why. There were victims, family victims, for example, who just sat down quietly waiting for a convict. Somebody is convicted, sentenced to life imprisonment. Five years later, the parole board says he's now a rehabilitated uh, 
citizen and they release him from prison. An angry family member of the victim that he killed can just take a gun and shoot him. So instead of having one convict, you have one dead person and another convict. And the sociological school was able to bring in different uh, perspective into how some of these things could be handled. In the US, for example, if you have a payroll board hearing to show that a prisoner has been, a prisoner, for example, who killed someone has been rehabilitated, they will receive letters and representation from the family of the person he killed. If, and it will be under consideration, if, for example, you are doing a plea bargain of someone who killed someone and you are thinking, okay, instead of first degree murder, we can only have a second degree murder or manslaughter or whatever. The families of those people will be brought into consideration because they will also make representation. Then for sentencing, when it is time for sentencing and you are making a, you are, you are doing allocutors, for example, the family of the people that this person killed are also able to come in and say, no, do not listen to any evidence he's trying to give you in terms of mitigation. He's a complete animal for doing this. And then they will also show what he did, how it has affected them. This person has all that as sociological imputes. Now, another impute is construction of statutes. And this comes with a little story. The background of that story could, uh, is the American Constitution. There was an argument relating to whether the American Constitution could be interpreted strictly or in a liberal manner. And some conservatives focused on the idea that there must be, there must be adherence to the original intention of the Constitution. But as we all know, constitutions, because of the nature of giving validity to the other to other laws are basically cowed in open words, where the founding fathers understood that the constitution is like a skeleton and may require jurists and future generations to put flesh onto that skeleton. And because of that, people believed that the constitution should be interpreted in a liberal manner. Nigeria, that was what the Attorney General, the case in uh, the case of Attorney General versus Attorney General of the Federation versus Attorney General of Abia State basically says that that is the nature of the constitution. And that is the way you must interpret the constitution. However, in the US, there was an understand there was um, a conflict in terms of how do you interpret the United States Constitution. During this time, there was the, I think that was during the Reagan era where his attorney general, Edwin Meese at the time, thought that the focus should be on original interpretation. If you remember when we did interpretation of statutes in the first semester, we talked about an exception to the contemporaneous meaning. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Where we say one of the exceptions to the contemporaneous meaning, that is, the general rule is to interpret the section of a statute in line with the time it was made, but that there was an exception. It can be enlightened to bring in newer realities and new facts. You remember? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Now, basically, what the, uh, the Americans, the, the argument was, we have a constitution, let us adhere strictly to it. It is judicial activism for judges to be improvising on the words. And the answer was constitutions were devised to be improvised on. The whole design of a constitution was for improvisation. Why? Because if you are talking about strict interpretation, and you are talking about original intention, 
then you could have in the US, for example, the constitution never said that the United States could raise an air force. Why? Because when the constitution was being made, nobody contemplated warfare by airplanes. The constitution didn't talk about anybody giving uh, frequencies to radio stations or TV stations, because what they had at the time, if at all, were telegraphs. So the government would not have been able to raise an air force, even though war was tilting towards air power. The government could not have had even a central bank or what they call the reserve bank because the constitution did not specifically empower the president of the United States to have a central bank to regulate banks. Now, a lot of the people who engaged in this argument were sociological scholars who were able to show that there has to be a context in terms of interpreting, um, in, in terms of interpreting laws. And also, we might these two in terms of what the American uh, intention argument and all that. Now, for the trial by jury, we also find out that when the when the uh, constitution talks about things such as a jury of your peers in the United States, these were also the work of sociological scholars. Why? Because the focus was on people that were also members of the society who can relate to the person, to the accused person in the dock and be able to give uh, rulings relating to guilt. Obviously they can decide on guilt and then the judges sometimes can decide, uh, the judges can decide on sentencing. And you find out that there is an interaction again with the society in terms of where you have uh, a trial by jury. Then another impact is in respect of legal education. How do we study law? In the old days, what we used to do is we just dictate notes, you copy the notes, when you get home, you read it. Then the whole idea of using PowerPoints and creating headings upon which you can have a discussion came in. And that opened the whole idea of teaching in law to a completely different, it took it to a completely different uh, sphere because now you are having discussions in class rather than being taught or rather than being lectured, so to say. And when you have that discussion, one of the main things that happens is the teacher becomes the greatest student and the student also becomes the greatest teacher. Another one is introducing administrative processes into, into law. And when you, one of the ways you can admin, uh, introduce administrative processes into law, especially you know, when we talked about digital evidence and all that, which was not in the Evidence Act before. But when you also look at the Evidence Act and we are talking about digital evidence even today, you look at the Evidence Act and you are looking at the Evidence Act that is still talking about storing something inside a laptop or a mainframe computer. Which anybody in computer science will tell you doesn't make any sense. Why? Because information, the fact that I can access information online with my laptop without that information ever entering into the storage system of my laptop. So for our, jurisprudence, for our jurisprudence relating to evidence in Nigeria, there's still a lot of work to do. But in other countries, how evidence is introduced again has changed because of the work of um, uh, scholars of the sociological school. Then for compliance guarantee methods, 
what I mean basically here is how do you ensure compliance in laws? We were talking about obedience of laws and all that. Now, how do you ensure compliance? When you say under the Administration of Criminal Justice Act that a police, the police should uh, not hold someone in detention longer than so, so, and so, so, and so, so time. How do you make sure that this is complied with? When you use bland, vague words like the reasonable man, what does the reasonable man mean? When you say within a reasonable time, what does it mean? And we found out that there's a lot of work by sociological scholars in terms of how you can aggregate some of these uh, loose terms and come at a specific definition as to what exactly these things mean. Because it is that lack of clarity that allows impunity in uh, the administration of justice. So that ends today's class. Any questions? Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. I'm really sorry, sir. I want you to explain the, the America with China Intention Agreement. So my line was somehow breaking when you were explaining. This. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send everybody a reference here on sociological school, an article that I wrote. Now, the American original, and I think it captures it basically. The American original intention was, you know, we said when a legislature makes law, you can only interpret in line with the intention of legislature. And what they were saying is when you make a constitution, the only way to read that constitution is by following the original intention of the framers of that constitution. And the argument is, if you are talking about an original intention of the framers of the constitution, then what you are talking about is basically technically what we call the contemporaneous meaning, which is the meaning understood at the time of making the law. And in our general discussion on uh, interpretation of constitutions for the first semester, we said that there was an exception to that. And the liberal thinkers, made mostly of um, sociological scholars, were saying the original intention argument cannot work. And that the reason it cannot work was in the form of the constitution itself. That the constitution giving validation to other laws was seen as a constitution that understood that it couldn't encompass strict terms, but lose terms with an understanding that there will be jurists and that there will be other people of other generations that can give clothing and flesh to the skeletal form of the constitution because a constitution can only be skeletal. And because of that, we talked about in Nigeria, for example, the attorney general of uh, Abia State, uh, the attorney general of Abia State case said more or less the same thing. And we said, if you follow the stupidity of the original intention argument, then you realize that the president of the US has done so many things that he's not empowered to do strictly by the American constitution, but that courts have allowed him to do those things because they thought those things were ancillary to his powers, such as, for example, setting up a central bank called the Federal Reserve Board, such as, for example, setting up a regulatory committee that gave frequencies for radio stations and TV stations. And now internet and um, data stations. And the reason is simple, because for each time a constitution comes into play, in, into uh, enactment, people cannot understand how far the level of development will be. It, what that meant was also that the Americans could not have 
the America, since the Constitution did not specifically say that the US president could raise an air force, it means that the president did not have the power to have an air force. Even though as a prelude to the first, uh, to the second world war particularly, air forces became the dominant means of fighting wars and protecting the fatherland. So the original intention argument was slack in the sense that a more liberal interpretation of the constitution was what made it functional and useful to the society. I hope that is understood. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Aku. Yes, sir. Uh, so I, I want to be uh, clear on the issue of evidence, what sociology really contributed to evidence. I didn't get that part. You, you talked about other countries have evolved, although Nigeria seems static in our uh, use of evidence, but other countries have evolved through the so use of the sociological school. So I, what have they really contributed as regards evidence? Sir? Thank you. Okay. Now there were the whole idea of digital evidence was a little slow in coming to us in Nigeria. When you look at your evidence, act, I've forgotten the section now that talks about introduction of uh, digital evidence. You just found it. Section 89, if I'm mistaken. Section 89. Computer. Do you have it before you so that you read it? Before. It has to do with computer generated evidence. I can't remember the section precisely. Okay. Even your computer phrase using uh, talking about computer generated evidence is a little bogus. And I'll tell you why. Evidence can be generated without a computer. And when you talk about, I mean, when you talk about computer, for example, when you look at that section, it basically talks about storing things in the mainframe of a computer and how to verify something that is stored in the mainframe. Now, as I'm talking to you, I have what is stored in the mainframe of my, what is stored in my laptop. I have what resources. I have this PowerPoint presentation that we have now. Fine, it is stored in my laptop, but we could have been using a PowerPoint presentation that is not stored in my laptop, right? Yes, sir. And yes, the sir. reason is this. We could have been using, we can be using another site that has the same presentation that we are accessing and it is not stored on my laptop. We could be on YouTube, use, uh, watching uh, images on YouTube. Why? Because, and if it is a copyrighted image, it will not be downloadable even onto my laptop, even if I wanted it to. So the point I'm making is there is an indication that while we are trying to move forward digitally, we are still holding on to the old ideas of what a computer is. And digital evidence is talking about something that is digital, not something that is in a specific storage or data bank. And a lot of that, and I'll, I'll give you another example. When there's something called triangulation, which is what um, enforcement, police enforcers use when if somebody commits a crime and he's stupid enough to have his phone in his pocket while committing the crime, if he receives anything, either a text message, a phone call or whatever, they use the masks to triangulate his location at the time. So if you kill someone here today and somebody sent you a text message or your laptop or, or, or sorry, your telephone updated itself or something while you're in uh, Saboke and you say, no, you are not in Saboke, you are in Lagos. You can use triangulation tied to the time that murder occurred for them to find out that you are in Ilori and you are in this particular location. Now, that kind of information, our evidence are, still has 
issues in terms of how you can introduce and verify those kinds of information. And part of the reason will be that that information may not be stored in the hard drive of a, of a computer. I hope we are getting that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So there's yeah. a lot of movement that is required. But in other countries, you find because of that synthesis called upon by the sociological scholars, you find out that there is a quicker synthesis of these other disciplines into law in terms of how law operates and then how you can embrace all those other disciplines especially things like law in lawmaking and all that. If you had people that are vast in terms of what the digital world is and what it is bringing, I believe that the evidence act may not have come out in the form that it came out. Any other question, comment? Thank you, sir. Okay, we are still going to go around this for towards the end of the semester when I said we will not, now what we are focusing on is knowledge. The next thing after focusing on knowledge will now be how to pass the exam. Because I saw someone, uh, there was a time I think someone was having a chat problem and uh, was having a network problem and what he, the person wrote is, if we keep having this network problem, please, let's do face to face. If we keep having this network problem, many people will fail. The fear was failure. The fear was not lack of knowledge. And what is important is that you have the knowledge first and foremost. Then again, I'm not unaware of that other fear that we could fail or we could uh, do so, 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 and so. So we'll address that when the time comes by shrinking the areas that you have to concentrate on and then also talking about what you do in terms of answering a question on jurisprudence that is focused on abstract things such as in the schools of, of jurisprudence. We'll take care of all that at the end of the uh, class. Now, for next week, and please read up on it. Monday, hopefully, we are going to deal with the reality school and critical legal studies. And next week, Friday, hopefully, we'll come down to the mother of all schools, the natural law school. And I hope that uh, some of you will be able to access uh, Professor Jalai's uh, the natural law experience in Nigeria, because that is basically what we are going to focus on during that lecture. I hope that is OK. Yes, sir. How many of you are able to download? Because we set up, I set up a YouTube channel where you could review our lectures and also to download if you needed to. How many have been able to download from that YouTube channel? I've been, I've able, been to able, able to download it. Okay. Now, what we also need, we may need comments there to assist other people trying to download and all that stuff. So in your comments, please be nice to everybody, be nice to me and be nice to your colleagues. And then try to get us to focus on certain things based on your interaction with the, with the lectures in the downloads that you, that you have. Hopefully we'll get this there too today and see how far we go. But for next week, Monday, Critical Legal Studies, the Reality School, Friday, um, We'll deal with the natural law school of law. Then next week, we now go back to review and recap, and then having a better understanding on how to approach some of these things so that it's easier for you. So have All a right. nice day. Thank you so much, sir. God bless you, sir. Take care. Cheers and have a nice day. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, sir. Have a nice weekend, sir. <laughs>